Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to um, the breakout session three, um, Innovation. We're going to talk about re-envisioning parks and civic spaces. Um, I am Colleen Swain, and I am the Assistant Director of the Center City Development and Operations Department with the City of San Antonio. And part of my job is that um, I oversee development in the Center City area and in, in the core. Um, I most recently uh, had the pleasure of working on Travis Park, so hopefully you've been to the new re-envisioned Travis Park and take, are taking advantage of some of the free health and fitness classes and activities that we are programming in that space. Um, I also worked on the mobile food truck program, I've done Better Block, uh, various concept plans, retail studies, and um, also parking day. So. Um, and today I'm excited because we have two fabulous speakers. We have Omar Gonzalez from the Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation. Um, Mr. Gonzalez is a San Antonio native, went to Central Catholic, and then he went away and he went to uh, the school of University of Pennsylvania, uh, and he got a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from the Wharton School, and then he went on to get his MBA from Stanford University. He has worked for the city and KPMG Consulting, um, and he has uh, worked on urban development projects. He currently serves as the Director of Planning and Operations and Development with the Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation, um, and he's working on the master planning and mixed-use development of approximately seven, 70 acres within San Antonio's downtown. Um, he's also very involved in the community. He serves as Vice uh, Chair of LOOP, uh, which is a nonprofit organization for San Antonio's young professionals. So if you're not a member, you need to talk to Omar about becoming a member. Um, and he's a trustee of the Awesome Foundation. Um, and that foundation gives out grants, $1,000 grants every month. Um, and he's a member of the Leadership San Antonio LSA Class 38. I'm also pleased to um, introduce Laura Exparza. She is from Trinity University and she has a bachelor's degree in Latin. Uh, American Studies and a master's degree from UTSA in kinesiology and health. Um, she with concentrations in exercise science and health promotion. She currently works as a project coordinator at the Institute for Health Promotion Research at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And her projects involve collaborating with communities to develop and evaluate programs that promote healthy lifestyles, including physical activity. Um, she also applies her professional experience and personal interest in physical activity promotion by serving as the vice chair of the Active Living Council of San Antonio. And now um, I'd like to let uh, Omar uh, provide us some information on Hemisphere Park. Thank you, Colleen. It is. Uh the lights are really intense there, so we can't see any of your faces when we're sitting there. So I'll use this opportunity to kind of get a little bit closer so uh, I can see your reactions. Um, so I was really excited about the title of the conference. Um, so public health in the built environment. And obviously, uh, those of you who are from San Antonio are probably very familiar with Hemisphere. Uh, the site of the 1968 World's Fair, obviously where the Tower of the Americas exists today, uh, and is still activated somewhat as a park today. But what we have planned, if you haven't seen this before, I think it's going to really change your mind about that intersection of parks and the built environment. And so, uh, you know, what, what I was really excited about is, is looking at public health from a variety of perspectives. And so what we're building or what we're trying to build is essentially a neighborhood district. So when I say neighborhood district, it means people are going to be living there, people will be working there, and then people will be visiting. And so it becomes this area that is very pedestrian oriented. It's very, very friendly to bicycles. We're going to allow automobiles to go uh, inside of Hemisphere, which is very different than it is today. But we see it in a, in a really different way. So uh, I'll show you some images of what complete streets are. But what I'm hoping to do is really kind of broaden the conversation today uh, and, and think about our parks as a real asset to our public health. And then when you think of built environment, uh, start thinking about really the benefits to things like density um, and having mixed use structures and sharing parking and things like this. So uh, I'll give you some images. And uh, if you don't know kind of where Hemisphere is, who's, who's from San Antonio? OK, so most of you are, not all of you. Uh, we're, this is uh, South Alamo Street. We're at Cesar Chavez, but kind of way down here. 
uh, to the west side. So if you take Cesar Chavez traveling eastbound, you'd eventually hit IH-37. This is where the ITC, or the Institute of Texas Cultures is. A lot of people ask, well, what's gonna happen with the ITC? What's gonna happen with the federal courthouse? Because those are kind of the more iconic features or structures, if you will, within the hemisphere footprint. We're, uh, we don't own those or control them. And when I say we, uh, H-Park, which is Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation, is a local government corporation where nonprofit 501c3 established by city council specifically for the mandate of redeveloping and improving uh, the park, Hemisphere Park. So when I say we, it's actually the city that owns all this land that's in green. Um, and what we're looking at is a series of different parks. And so the first phase is called Yanaguana Garden. This is the first time in public I actually say Yanaguana Garden. Um, Yanaguana Garden is named so because the original Paiaya natives who were here in San Antonio named the river and its surroundings, so it, it also means refreshing water, Yanaguana. And we really love that word. Um, we think it's super authentic to San Antonio. Where else can you have a Yanaguana something? And then the, and then the word garden to imply, um, you know, not just green space, but also an area of congregating. So. Uh, this was called Play Escape in the past, and, and the negative reaction was that Play Escape felt like it was just for children. But we want adults to play too. Um, so Yanaguana Garden is phase one. Construction will start in July. Um, phase two is Civic Park, and this will have a better name uh, as, we, as we get more into it. And then phase three is Tower Park. Um, Civic Park is actually where the current convention center, the western side of the convention center exists today. So if you've been annoyed by the uh, rerouting of cars on Market Street, it's gonna be all be worth it, trust me. So Market Street is being rerouted to allow for the convention center to expand to the east. Once the convention center expands to the east, they'll actually uh, deconstruct the western portion, the older 1968 portion, and that'll essentially be what we like to call the front porch of San Antonio. So right on the corner of uh, South Alamo and Market Street will be the entrance to the new hemisphere. And then phase three, we haven't really uh, um, done a lot of design on this, so I don't have much, but uh, Tower Park is what we're calling it. But the idea is it's this uh, succession of parks, so kind of a hierarchy of parks. And then you'll see we actually have buildings around the parks, and so we're not just providing green space, but we're providing what we like to call uh, a district. So I talked to you a little bit about park streets. Um, phase one involves four streets. South Alamo, Goliad, which is kind of the extension of Nueva Street, uh, Water Street, which exists today. If you know where that uh, firehouse is on South Alamo Street, there's a little bitty portion of Water Street left. Water Street actually used to run all the way to Commerce Street, and it ran parallel to the Etsequia, hence its name, Water Street. Uh, so we'll reintroduce a portion of Water Street and then, uh, and then a portion of Cesar Chavez. What we're looking for when we call kind of park streets or complete streets is, is kind of this whole notion that everyone shares the road. So roads aren't just for pedestrians and they're not just for cars either, but they're for everyone. And so we have some really cool learnings around the world that show how you can do these streets. Um, this is pretty close actually. So this is Goliad Street today where you see pedestrians, bicyclists sharing the road. What you don't see is cars. You actually see why, uh, because cars aren't allowed there. But what we could do is open it up something like the Pearl um, that, you know, is, is, is just down the street where you have kind of flat curbs. And so that really gives uh, a pedestrian the idea that they can walk across the street at any time. There's no striping you'll notice on this street, uh, which we also like that. Um, and it just allows for a lot more flexibility in a street than kind of the rigidity that, uh, that the engineers love to put in our streets. So we could take South Alamo that looks like this today. This is the Magic Theater. So you're kind of uh, just north of the intersection at Cesar Chavez and you're looking north. Uh, this would be the Fairmont Hotel and the uh, Hilton Palacio del Rio. And so you see this street today, uh, one, probably your first reaction is, God, it's really empty. Uh, and it is, uh, about 7,000 streets, uh, 7,000 cars per day go on South Alamo. That could be accomplished in a one way uh, in each direction and with just two lanes, we could accommodate for that amount of traffic. So. Our idea is not to bring it down to necessarily to just two lanes, but to create a local access area. So local access would allow for parking, which is huge, um, because there's just not a lot of parking in downtown, as you probably know. And then uh, a share row, so a shared uh, right away with cyclists. We also see a, a median landscape that also um, will capture stormwater and essentially purify it before it enters back into the river. 
Um, and then we love the idea of kind of the, the, the flat curves where you can actually spill out into the street. So you could close off parking spaces whenever you need. You could actually close off the whole local access and still have cars going in the middle of the street. So imagine Fiesta or Luminaria, events like that where you could actually spill out into the street. So uh, Complete Streets starts in this fall and we're looking at a spring 2015 completion time and that will actually parallel well with the Yanaguana Garden. So show you um, what our design statement is for Yanaguana. Kind of the key words are this play, recreational environment, all ages, and then obviously this is for the community. And so I think what's not to be missed about Hemisphere is that downtown today is, is typically a place that you take your visitors. Um, a lot of downtown today is known for the Riverwalk and the Alamo, something that locals probably don't go to that often. Uh, but we want Hemisphere a place that's for locals and a place that you want to frequent uh, as often as possible. So not only is it um, you know, a place where I think we're going to have all local shops, local restaurants, um, but it'll, it'll also be a place that's kind of dynamic. And so you have changing activities, changing programming, so really encouraging people uh, to visit Hemisphere as often as possible. So talk about Yanaguana Garden a bit. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, from a bird's eye view. So just to orient you, this is South Alamo Street again, uh, Water Street that I talked about, and then Goliad. And it's about a six acre site. So four and a half of the six acres are essentially dedicated to park. And if you're looking at it from kind of this perspective, uh, it would look something like this in a rendering. So just to kind of point out the major features, uh, which are really exciting. One is a promenade, which runs kind of through the spine of Yanaguana. <clears throat> and we like to parallel that to the river where if you're walking along the river, there's surprises at every turn. And so the idea is that this spine takes you to different areas of hemisphere. We'll have a sand dig area for children to dig up uh, artifacts that relate back to the ITC or to UNAM, two great, uh, or to Instituto, three great institutions that we have on site. Um, we'll have a splash pad area. So, you know, imagine when it starts heating up again, I guess it already has, <laughs> uh, you really want to get into some water pretty soon. And then we imagine places for adults. <clears throat> so uh, maybe it's a beer garden with bocce, uh, bocce ball, ping pong. And so kind of from the ground level, it looks something like this, where you could have the oversized chess pieces. You've got great water play that's interactive. Um, <clears throat> here's kind of a look at the water and the sand. And then climbing structures. Uh, when we first showed this to the city, they said, you can't build that. <laughs> It's a 30-foot high climbing structure, uh, but we've done all the research, we've done the due diligence. If you fall from the climbing structure, <clears throat> at any point you can't fall more than four feet. So despite it looking dangerous, it's actually not, um, which is pretty exciting. And so we'll customize one to be more San Antonio. Uh, and then we love the idea of having interactive public art. So we're working closely with PASA office on trying to figure out not just art that's pretty to look at, but art that maybe teaches you something, uh, maybe requires you to interact with it. <clears throat> Some of the gateways are really cool. This is a Walhalla system that was developed in the Netherlands. It's, it's an enclosed climbing structure, but it also can be a really cool background where you can hang a white sheet and project movies on there. So, um, you know, that becomes a gateway element. If you've been through Hemisphere recently, you probably notice a lot of boarded up, beautiful, uh, older buildings. Some of them dating as far back as 1780s. So the idea is how do you take these buildings and then animate them? So what we want to do is we want to create um, a place that, that, that helps activate the park. So we like the idea of cafes, galleries, restaurants, places that you as a local want to go to. So the schedule is, um, you'll probably see a little bit of construction going on this month. Uh, we're essentially building one of the emergency access roads. And then come July, we'll actually fence that whole southwestern part of Hemisphere, the Yanaguana Garden area, so that by spring 2015, we can open it up and really have people enjoying the space. And then um, Civic Park. So Civic Park, what I call kind of the, uh, the front porch, that's our iconic community gathering area. So this is what we really want people to think of, you know, kind of as, um, <clears throat> as they enter San Antonio, this is what they're going to see. So again, the, the movement of the uh, convention center makes way for <clears throat> the building of the, of the Civic Park. And this is kind of, uh, we just hired a designer. They're out of uh, Seattle, Washington, called GGN. They've done some really cool things around the world, like the uh, Princess Di Memorial in Hyde Park. Um, they've designed the Lori Gardens at Millennium Park in Chicago, and then uh, Olympic Park in 
Seattle, so kind of in their, in their hometown. So we're going to use them to kind of create more design, but we had a lot of public outreach and gather from the community kind of the elements or the amenities that San Antonians wanted. And so this is where this, uh, these images come from. So passive and active spaces. Some people just want to sit and read in a park. Other people want to, you know, throw a Frisbee or hacky sack. <clears throat> Exceptional programming for daily use. Uh, you know, I overheard y'all talking about yoga in the park. So we imagine this would be a perfect place to have yoga classes in the morning. You could have the movies uh, by Moonlight, which they currently do at Hemisphere, but you could do it, you know, 10 times as big. <clears throat> and then amenities to enhance, to enhance the park experience. So if you think of when you go to the park, and think of if you go to Hemisphere today, the first thing you're going to say is like, well, where do I get a drink, or where can I get some food? Um, and so these amenities will really help serve the park visitors so that you can stay longer at a park and you can enjoy it. And hidden, hidden parking is a key for us. Um, we know that San Antonians and Texans love to drive. Uh, we're not going to get everyone out of their car. But what we can do is hide the parking. So we don't like the idea of surface parking lots. Um, we like the idea of either underground or wrapped. This is Millennium Park in Chicago. This entire, whoops, this entire area is parking. So they have uh, over 4,000 vehicles park underneath Millennium Park every day. Uh, we lo we're looking to maybe do the same thing at Civic Park, where you could actually park under the park and have green on top. Discovery Green in Houston does it as well. So there are examples. Uh, we love shade, courtyard, and water. That's what all San Antonians said when we talked to them. Totally makes sense. So we've got some great courtyards. We'll have some amazing water features, um, a ton of interactive art, and, uh, and, and shade, of course. So this uh, timeline is a little bit longer. We just kicked off the design process with GGN. Um, we're going to go through fundraising. We launched uh, separately a uh, 501c3 called Hemisphere Conservancy. And Hemisphere Conservancy wants to tap the philanthropic world because we think that this is more than just a city effort. It should really be a community-wide effort. Then we'll get into P3, uh, which is public-private partnerships. And <clears throat> the idea behind P3s is that the vertical development is done by a private developer. So if you think of the edges of a park, those edges of the park will be built by someone on the private side, and they'll pay a long-term lease to the city as land owners. That long-term lease then goes towards maintenance, operations, and activation of the park. So it's what we like to call the virtuous cycle. Uh, and then Hemisphere is more than a park, and so I, I think you all kind of get this point. Um, you know, we love the idea of, of uh, community gathering spaces, uh, you know, places that you want to go on a frequent basis, you know, the whole walkable, bikeable nature. And then uh, what we really refer to is in 1968, to get ready for the World's Fair, the true effort really started about 1964. And so we're kind of at that point right now where we're, we, we really need to harness the energy behind all the citizens and all the city leaders to say Hemisphere is our priority. Let's really get this done. So um, I'll leave you with a couple of uh, viewpoints of the Civic Park. Um, these renderings were done just recently. So you can see kind of looking over the uh, western side of the convention center. Um, this would be the major park area, and then we would surround it with some new uh, mixed-use developments. And if you take a little bit of a step back, uh, you've really got this uh, you know, amazing stretch of Goliath, a ton of trees, um, a lot of open space, a lot of public space. So um, get excited, people, and uh, I think we'll, I'll, we'll answer questions at the end. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Esparza, um, and my job today is to talk about the role of physical activity and how parks and civic spaces are ideal places to help be, people be more physically active and to improve the community health um, by focusing on them. Uh, the evidence is clear physical activity is essential for good health. It's a powerful tool to both treat and prevent chronic disease and obesity, as well as premature death. 
Uh, and as our physical activity levels increase, the health benefits that we enjoy also increase. Physical activity has an astonishing array of harmful health effects. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you live, um, inactive lifestyle is associated with many types of disease and serious health conditions. The evidence is irrefutable. People who are physically active live longer and healthier lives. And increasing physical activity not only prevents disease and obesity, it promotes health pe for people of all ages. For instance, it reduces symptoms of stress and depression, improves sleep and overall quality of life. And many people are surprised to hear that it is better to be fat and fit than to be thin and unfit. But the bottom line is that people who are physically active live longer and healthier lives regardless of their weight status. And people can improve their health just by increasing their physical activity levels. We do have national physical activity guidelines that outline the minimal amount of physical activity it takes to, be, to stay healthy. Um, adults need 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. You can think about this as a 30 minute brisk walk at least five days of the week. You can cut this number, uh, the number of minutes in half by increasing the intensity and doing 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. So for instance, instance running instead of walking. And then at least two days of muscle strengthening activities is important as well. Youth need twice that amount of activity. They need at least 60 minutes of, of moderate to vigorous aerobic physical activity. And kids need activities that are uh, a variety of activities that are enjoyable and age appropriate. Um, also important, and that, that's not in the guidelines yet, is the importance of flexibility and the avoidance of excessive sitting, which is one reason why we've, we've uh, tried to get everybody up and out of their chairs several times today. So unfortunately, we do have a physical inactivity crisis. 25% uh, of the adults, that's it, only 25% of the adults meet the physical activity guidelines. And there's another 25% of adults that don't get any physical activity at all. And then in youth, only 30% of youth meet the physical activity guidelines, and 15% of youth don't get any physical activity at all. There's many factors that contribute to this, of course. Uh, Media-dominated lifestyle, TV, phones, games, computers, um, and increased in a dependence on cars for transportation. We drive everywhere in San Antonio. And an urban and suburban infrastructure that does not support active lifestyle, such as lack of sidewalks and safe pedestrian crossings and lack of nearby green space and recreation facilities and lack of destinations, such as stores that we can walk to. So our, our uh, lifestyles are very different than just a generation ago, and we have essentially engineered physical activity out of our lives. And people who are not physically active enough are at increased risk for serious health problems, but this is fixable. And people can improve their health just by becoming more physically active. So most people want to be healthy, yet many do not engage in enough physical activity to be healthy. So what would it take to help people be more physically active? Well, the good news is we already know a lot about physical activity and health and what it takes to help people be more active. We have the research. We have physical activity guidelines that outline minimal amounts of physical activity. And a national physical activity plan, which is a comprehensive set of policies and programs and initiatives that aim to increase physical activity in all segments of the American population. So the next step is to take these evidence-based tools and make it local to make a difference in the lives of families here in San Antonio. Clearly, individuals must take responsibility for making lifestyle choices to improve their own health. However, as a community, we must come together to create conditions that will help people make healthy choices. And of course, that's why we're here today. Telling people what they should do is not enough. If we tell people they should be more physically active and then we send them out into communities that do not support active lifestyle, the current high levels of physical inactivity will remain right where they are right now. If we expect people to become physically active, we must create environments that help residents make healthy choices. The healthy choice should not always be the hard choice. The healthy choice should often be an easy choice. And this is where active living comes in. So there's many ways of being physically active, including exercising and playing sports. And there's also active living, which is, as said, we've talked about earlier, walking to the grocery store, riding a bike to work, walking to school. 
And there's many influences on, uh, our, on our ability to live actively. For instance, people are more active when they live in neighborhoods with sidewalks, parks, bike lanes, and safe streets. Neighborhood safety is a big concern. Crime and neighborhood disorder like broken windows and litter and graffiti and stray dogs make it dangerous or uncomfortable for people to be physically active outdoors. Research shows that residents of neighborhoods with more social disorder are less active. And then there's the time we spend behind our desks or behind the wheel. So why focus on active living? Well, active living, uh, increasing physical activity is a powerful way to not only prevent obesity and chronic disease, but to promote health overall for children and adults. And again, people who are active and fit are healthier regardless of their weight. Increasing people's activity levels can move the needle on our community's health status. And since we've engineered physical activity out of our lives in recent decades, we're now feeling the health effects of just that. And reintegrating physical activity into our lives is critical to getting the overall population moving again. And there's some steps that we can take to live more actively than we do now. So what is it that gets people moving more? Two things, one is programs to promote physical activity combined with changes to our built environment. And there's a growing body of evidence to support this. And this slide shows uh, some key resources of evidence about environmental changes that promote physical activity. Um, I also wanted to tell you that on, at the front of the stage, and feel free to come up and get one either now or, or on your way out, um, is a resource sheet with some other sources of evidence about uh, active lifestyle, um, the evidence behind um, active lifestyle and um, some other programs that you might find helpful. So when it comes to transforming San Antonio into an active city and a healthier city, we are already doing a lot of things right. Um, I, there are several examples of efforts to align goals and to collaborate acro across organizations. And the organizations depicted on this slide, the Active Living Council, Mayor's Fitness Council, Metro Health, and SA 2020, um, over the last couple of years, we've seen a big effort among these groups to align goals and to collaborate. Multi-sector collaboration is particularly important as well. And because we get a richer and different kind of conversation when we talk across uh, sectors. And a couple of examples of that in San Antonio, for one, is this multidisciplinary conference today. This is a relatively new concept for San Antonio, and it's a great example of a multi-sector collaboration. And then the Active Living Council is, uh, was deliberately structured to, as a multi-sector group. We have uh, business and industry, education, childhood, after school, health care, mass media, public health, park recreation, fitness and sports, transportation, land use, and community design, volunteer and nonprofit. And just in case we left anybody out, we have an other sector and a community sector. No way to leave anybody out. So these are just, uh, you know, San Antonio has done well recently in its increased efforts to align and collaborate across organizations. And uh, we're starting to benefit from just that. So San Antonio has an active living council, which is this community group committed to promoting physical activity and active living in San Antonio. We also have an active living plan for a healthier San Antonio. Um, this is the first ever local adaptation of the National Physical Activity Plan. It includes strategies to increase physical activity in all segments of San Antonio. And the strategies included in the plan are evidence-based and locally appropriate. It's a roadmap for transforming San Antonio into an active living community. And in the spirit of alignment and collaboration, the Mayor's Fitness Council not only endorsed the plan when it came out in 2012, but last year they incorporated the Active Living Council as a full standing Mayor's Fitness Council committee. And this year they're focused on adopting the plan for implementation. So it's important to think about expanding the time people spend in public spaces because this is active time. And research shows that parks and green space provide opportunities for physical activity. And there's two things that lead to increased park utilization and increased physical activity. One is improving a park's social environment, such as cleaning up graffiti improving, and improving uh, people's perceptions about the safety of the park or the public space. And two is imp improving park quality. So starting with our existing spaces, how can we activate them? How do we encourage physical activity in public spaces? How do we transform an existing space into a healthy place? 
Well, similar to what John Simmerwin was saying earlier, is if we can figure out how to make physical activity easy and fun and popular, it becomes easier for us to encourage people to be physically active. So when we think about what is it that will make, a, make it a place that people will want to be, some strategies to consider are to build fun destinations in outdoor public spaces, and it sounds like Hemisphere is well on its way to that. These places become richer destinations in the process. Um, but we also, and you know, live music and fun programming and, um, and if we think creatively and inventive and lightweight, um, these are all great strategies. And we also have to think about safety and security. So I wanted to share a few examples of successful initiatives to promote active living in San Antonio. And kudos to Colleen and her group for Travis Park. Uh, raise your hand if you've been to Travis Park since it was uh, repurposed, let's call it that. Okay, great, several of you have. So an intense focus on the social environment and park quality occurred recently at Travis Park, and their makeover includes movable furniture, kiosks with books and games for people to check out, a giant chessboard, and much more. And it's an example of, I don't know what your budget was, but it's an example of how you don't have to spend millions and millions of dollars, which are resources that are not always available on a new community center, on a building. Um, you can take the lighter, quicker, cheaper approach, um, adding elements to an existing space to turn it into a healthy place. Um, and so, and when I look at some of this picture, I think about this, the guy on the left, uh, you have an office worker talking on his phone. Maybe he's doing a little walking at lunch instead of having lunch behind, uh, lunch behind his desk. And then there's kids in the background. There's just a variety of activities here. And it can be, the kind of programming you do, it can be yoga, that's great, yoga's great. Well, there's, yoga isn't for everybody, so why not dancing? So this, there's people uh, that they're, obviously Travis Park is making that possible to happen. So I'm a big champion of Cinclavia. Um, this is another example of a successful initiative to promote active living in San Antonio. And Cinclavia, as you know, probably is a five-hour car-free zone on several miles of city streets where participants can bike, run, play in the streets and participate in group exercises along the way. Um, the common term for this type of event is an open streets event, and some people call them temporary parks. And there's a growing body of evidence about the positive impact of open street events on physical activity levels. And I'm on the team at the UT Health Science Center that works with the YMCA on surveys of Ciclovia partic participants. And on the last survey, almost 60% said if they had not attended Ciclovia, they would not have been active that day. So which tells us that this, uh, this type of event motivates people to be active. More than half who attended previous Ciclovia events reported that their physical activity levels had actually increased since the event. So what this tells us is that this type of open street event has lasting positive effects on participants' physical activity levels. And almost half of participants said they had tried a new type of activity while at Ciclovia, which tells us that this event exposes people to new ways of being physically active. So we have two Ciclovia events per year right now in San Antonio. In Bogota, Colombia, which started the Ciclovia concept in the 1970s, they hold them every week. It's just part of the fabric of that city. Another example of a successful physical activity initiative is the 45, now 45 network, um, excuse me, 45 mile network of Greenway Trails, which is still growing. And it's increasingly popular among pedestrians and cyclists, individuals and families alike. But going back to the evidence, Greenway Trails are nice, but do we have evidence that this is a worthwhile investment? So the next two slides, which are also printed on posters outside, are from a group funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called Active Living Research. And Active Living Research provides many tools that you can use to back up initiatives to promote physical activity in parks and community settings. The um, ALR infographics that are on display today um, highlight uh, the current evidence about physical activity promotion. And this slide shows research demonstrating that trails, such as our Greenway Trails, leads to many benefits for communities, such as, uh, there's an economic argument for trails. One study found that for every dollar spent on trails, there's almost $3 in savings in direct medical costs. And this infographic focuses on what communities can do to promote physical activity. And again, regarding the trails, such as our Greenway Trails, um, one study found that people who live near trails are 50% more likely to meet physical activity guidelines. 
Research is available to justify these investments in trails and parks in terms of the health benefits that it brings, the investment brings. And again, please um, take a handout with you on your way out. So these are a few examples of how San Antonio has activated its parks and civic spaces in the last few years. And let's look at a few uh, examples from other communities. The Red Swing Project started in 2007 as an urban intervention in Austin. The swings are made of red painted wood and hung using retired rock climbing rope. They've now hung more than 200 red swings in the United States and around the world. This is a small, creative, and inexpensive way to increase movement and play. Another example is of how design in public spaces encourages movement and play is, are the sidewalk trampolines in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, along the harbor and elsewhere in the city. And you'll notice in the pictures that it's not just kids that are playing, it's the adults too. And I personally would love to see this somewhere, somewhere in San Antonio, because I'll be the first one on it. Um, another way to mix it up, uh, this intervention introduces signage that looks like a pedestrian crossing sign and interjects a little fun by advertising a skipping only zone. And there are images on the internet of people skipping, adults too, um, through this, you know, it's just a, a few feet from here to the other side of the, of the stage of a skipping only zone. It encourages physical activity and social interaction and fun. And the concept was not developed by kinesiologists, it was developed by designers who have a passion for cities and public art and exercise, and they wanted to explore ways that design in the public realm can encourage a more physically active and healthy lifestyle. These installations, these skipping zone installations, are temporary and movable, and they're located at sidewalks and street crossings and paths through parks. Simply pro providing information can also activate the population by, providing, uh, by promoting active transportation. Um, this kind of signage helps overcome misperceptions about distance, the distance from one place to another that often motivates people to drive instead of walk. So on the left is, a, is an example from Raleigh, North Carolina. It was originally an unsanctioned sign that was promptly removed by the city. But then the community expressed such support for the signage uh, that city council adopted the signs and it now has them installed as a strategy for promoting active transportation. And on the right is a photo from Cleveland, Ohio. And this is one I took of a sign that's in the University Circle area. And I thought it was great. It encourages walking because you find where you are and your dot. And then there's concentric circles going out that give you a sense of the distance from where you are to where you're going. And then there, uh, there's these little labels that'll tell you it's a five minute walk or a 10 minute walk or a 15 minute walk. So creative signage can help overcome perceptions about distance and promote active transportation, and this doesn't cost a lot. And then there's the power of paint. Peaceful Playgrounds is an organization that offers low-cost options to promote active play among kids during recess. It has, they have templates, stencils for game markings on courts, and their uh, researchers got involved, and they're finding that changing the environment with paint and creativity actually increases kids' physical activity levels during recess. And while this concept is designed for a school setting, it's a portable concept, um, and it could be done at public parks as well. And the bottom line is that we don't always have to have uh, large capital investments to increase physical activity in parks and civic spaces. Sometimes all it takes is paints and planters and signs and lines. And if we turn our public spaces into destinations, people will want to go there. Expanding the time people spend in public spaces is also spanning the time that they're active. So these are a few examples of creative ways to activate spark parks and civic spaces. And I would love for you all to be thinking about examples that you've seen on your own travels and share them with the group in a few minutes. So regardless of the sector you represent, whether it's public health, transportation, land use, community design, or another sector, there are many things that you can do to promote active living. You can be an active living champion. Get educated about physical activity and health. Understand that physical activity is critical to health, regardless of body weight. Know what works 
get to know proven strategies and approaches to help people be uh, to help people get moving sources of information about this are in the active living plan that i mentioned earlier the active living council's webpage on fitcitysa.com and uh, resources on the handout here and also we have sector fact sheets that are on the mayor's fitness council table around the corridor promote and implement the active living plan for a healthier san antonio foster an active living culture at your workplace or home or neighborhood insist on great sidewalks more pedestrian crossings connectivity so we have destinations to walk to and can get there safely the inactivity crisis is a community-wide challenge. People want healthy public spaces. However, engaging the community is key for finding solutions that will work for them. There are many, in closing, there's many benefits to activating our parks and public spaces. Economic development is one. Quality of life is another. Civic enga engagement. And then there's health. The increased time in public spaces is increased active time and the more physical activity we get the more health benefits we enjoy increasing physical activity is not a fight against obesity um, activating the population by making our public spaces healthy space places helps everybody regardless of age or body size or health status so let's expand our thinking about how to activate public spaces and look for opportunities to recapture even small spaces. And we saw some examples of that in previous sessions. It can be done cheaply, portable landscaping and paint, movable furniture. It creates a new destination and gets, gives people a place to go. And be sure to involve future users as you plan. The time spent on this up front is well spent time and critical to the long-term success of the project. Um, and examples of that are the Metro Health neighborhood projects and the Spark Parts, which engages the community. And uh, there'll be some, uh, Mayor's Fitness Council will be hosting some uh, active living town hall meetings. The first one is at the Witty on June 17th, so keep your ears open for that. So activating the population requires a comprehensive team approach, and we have to find out what the community wants. San Antonio has made a lot of progress, but we have a long way to go. And if every sector does its part, to engage the community and engages the community along the way, we can transform San Antonio into an active living community. So for more information about Active Living Council, uh, this is how you get to us, and thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so if anyone has a question for either Omar or Laura, let me know. Yes. So I'm, I'm really excited about Hemisphere Park. It looks great. Um, but I'm a resident of um, d the Denver Heights neighborhood, which is on the other side of on the east side. 37, yes. Um, so I'm wondering about how the new project is going to affect the connectivity of the residents that live in that area and downtown. Because I know with Market Street was a one-way street and it headed directly into the Denver Heights neighborhood. And now that's closed off and I don't know if that's going to be reopened. But um, maybe you've noticed that uh, Commerce Street does not go west into downtown. And so you can't get from the Denver Heights neighborhood to downtown. And then the only other thoroughfare is Iowa Street, which is quite south of there. There's an e the east-west access. And then otherwise, east-west access to um, the east side is then all the way up on Nolan Street. So right, yeah. can you address that? And I can, yeah, how? that's a great question. And we had a lot of uh, feedback in the design process um, and we listened to it. So some really huge changes for the east side in terms of connectivity to downtown. One is that um, if, you, if you'll notice Market Street and Commerce Street it, it is a perfect couplet. They're parallel streets that run in opposite directions. But then that ends 
uh, in the old situation. So before they started working on Market Street, Market Street would then kind of dive down south, and then you could either get on the highway or connect through Montana Street. And so we're rebuilding that couplet so that it remains parallel. So Market Street and Commerce Street will then remain parallel. There'll be a new frontage road that connects the two. So the beauty is if you're traveling now eastbound on Market Street, you will then be able to go northbound on the frontage road and then continue eastbound on Commerce Street. So we've really, so to your point about, you know, Commerce Street just being kind of one way westbound, it's now has that, uh, it now has that, that couplet that's been complete. And then the second piece is that uh, Montana Street, so that's kind of underneath where the, uh, where the Alamo Dome connection is, that'll now be um, a two-way street that allows for westbound traffic as well. So uh, we, we, there's really three connection points, Commerce Street, Montana Street, and Cesar Chavez Boulevard. And so what we aim to do is really create those to be gateways between the east side and downtown. I worked downtown briefly, um, and I could ride my bike down Montana Street and then sort of, su well, actually Commerce and then go through Sunset Station, and then there was a thoroughfare underneath. And so that would get me through Hemisphere Park to downtown. How is the walkability and bikeability going to be? Oh, it's going to be so much better. Um, so we're looking at, you That's know, what 16. what I wanted to hear. Yeah, yeah. No, we're looking at 16-foot wide sidewalks that are shared with uh, cyclists and pedestrians. That whole frontage road, that new frontage road, once that's built, uh, I think it'll blow your mind in terms of bikeability and walkability. We're, uh, if you'd notice on Commerce Street now, um, under the underpass, kind of where that, that lighting installation is, they've now expanded that sidewalk. Um, so on the southern side of the street, you have, have a huge sidewalk, and we intend to connect that all the way to the east. So. Huge improvements coming soon. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a, it's going to be a pain in the you know behind for the next few years, um, but I, I think it's all going to be worth it. So bear with us in construction. But thank you. Great comments. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the presentation to both of you. Uh, this question is for Omar. Uh, well, kind of a statement. Your one of your examples was uh, Millennium Park in Chicago. There's a really nice feature in that park, just just outside that park, and it's a uh, a bike facility. Uh, it's it's on grade bike parking, but also a couple layer, levels below grade with a bike mechanic and some supplies. Uh, it might be a good thing to consider. And uh, I'm from the Kamal Trails Alliance. We're a small 501c, so we'd love to bring my bike all the way downtown. For sure. So we have uh, an added benefit of having a tenanted hemisphere who is B-Cycle. Uh, and you're all, if you're not familiar with B-Cycle, it's basically a bicycle share program uh, where you essentially rent a bike for a limited number of time with, with stops. So we're talking to B-Cycle, they actually wanna expand that operation and we love the idea that that can become a place where you could take your bike to get repairs, maintenance, you could learn about bike repair and maintenance and maybe even have like a little trike park so you could start teaching kids the importance uh, of, of having to learn, learn, learning how to ride a bicycle. So, thank you. It w in terms of it being the most pedestrian unfriendly. <laughs> Did I say that? Yeah. yeah, I work there. I'm very familiar with that. Is that your question? What's your it question? Is, it is. What, any ideas? What can we do? I heard a rumor. Is, that, is Brian also up in here? That, um, that the Bear County Medical Foundation is going, is interested. It's a rumor. No, I, okay, so this is like third hand. Um, is interested in looking at that issue. And um, one is that we need to generate demand about the issue, so people need to ask for it. Um, I would, there's a, Mayor's Fitness Council has a new committee, um, you know, they're restructuring and um, for a lot of reasons, the Mayor's Fitness Council committee structure, and part of it is they want to implement the active living plan. And so um, there's a new committee called the Health Care Committee. And they are the ideal people, the ideal group um, to talk to about that. So Jeremy Beer is the coordinator for our Mayor's Fitness Council. You can talk to me afterwards. I can connect you with Active Living Council people about that. And there's talk. I don't think there's much more than that at this point that I'm aware of anyway. I can add to that. There actually is a master plan that's going to be coming out in about a month that talks about the pedestrian safety in the ballpark. That incorporates water slide. 
So they're, they're actually looking at creating a divided sidewalk, eight-foot sidewalks throughout the medical center and trying to separate pedestrian vehicular traffic, adding new um, off-street off uh, trails and connectivity. And I would actually like to talk with you after this about that master plan that's under, going underway right now. Well, that's great. I'm, glad, I'm, great to, I'm very grateful to hear that. 